My name is Chris Labrary. I'm the General Manager for the Census and Statistical Network Division at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And on behalf of the Australian Statistician and the ABS, I'd like to welcome you here in Canberra to this embargoed briefing. Sorry, it's not the embargoed briefing at all. <laughs> um, to this briefing, I'd like to welcome you all those of you here in Canberra in this great hall at the ANU, and also to all of you joining us from across Australia via our live webcast. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and to acknowledge members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community who may be attending today or watching online. For those census tragics among you, you're among friends. Our data, our, uh, se our data seminar today will provide you with key highlights from the second release of the 2016 Census of Population and Housing. Our first data release in June had an excellent reception and I hope you find this latest data, which was officially released yesterday, as interesting as we do. Just a couple of housekeeping issues for those in Canberra. Restrooms are available out the doors behind the Great Hall, and in the unlikely occurrence of an emergency, please follow the instructions given by University House staff. After today's presentation uh, in Canberra, a number of ABS staff will be available to discuss the top line findings related to this release and any upcoming product releases. And there, and there will be some light, refresh, light refreshments available in the breakout areas in the foyer. Um, there'll also be time for questions and answers at the end of today's sessions rather than through them. And we'll manage those uh, uh, for the people in the audience and also those people uh, online. Um, now, I would like to introduce our Census Program Manager, uh, at the ABS, Bindi Kinderman, uh, to commence today's proceedings. Well, good morning. We are really pleased to have the opportunity to share with you today the top line findings from the latest round of 2016 census data. This release builds on the demographic and social data that we released in June to provide new insights into Australia's working population, such as which industries and occupations are people working in, how we are getting to work, level of educational attainment, and much, much more. There are some really fascinating insights in this data. For example, we continue to see the trend of our farming workforce continue to age, raising questions about who are going to be our next generation of primary producers in this country. Today, we're streaming from Australia's National University, which is really an excellent venue for sharing our latest education data, where we're seeing more and more of us than ever before going on to further education after leaving schools, with some of the biggest gains being in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population groups. The data in this second release is some of our most detailed data. While today's presentation focuses mostly at the national level, the information will be published and available at very detailed state and community levels of geography, including information on small population groups. My job here today is to provide some context before I pass to my colleague Bjorn, who will present regarding our employment statistics, and then over to Phil Wise, who will present on our education stats. I'll then return to outline some of our key findings from our population mobility topics. For those of you who are new to census data, the census provides the base for the official counts of Australians and the dwellings in which they live. It also provides a snapshot of the economic, social and cultural makeup of our nation and is fantastic for telling the story of how our, our nation has changed over time. The census is unique in its ability to drill down to explore the circumstances of small populations and small communities. 
It's used for the allocation of government funds and services, but it's also used by many community groups, local councils, businesses and researchers for a much broader range of purposes. The Australian Census is considered world class and we were certainly very pleased with the results shown on this slide with an overall response rate comparable to previous censuses. The increased take up of the online form has seen some significant quality improvements due to a range of smart features on the online form, uh, which means that respondents can't inadvertently miss a question or give us invalid responses. There is also a real opportunity with the online form to ask for extra information, and this is really important for some of the topics we're looking at today. For example, for occupations such as teaching, if someone writes they're a teacher on the paper form, then we have no way of going back to that person and saying, well, what sort of teacher are you? But on the online form, we certainly can, and we can drill down to find out whether they're a preschool teacher or a secondary teacher. And that's just one of the examples. Many of you will be familiar with our release timetable. Census data releases are always done in stages, and this is done to ensure that we can get the data out as soon as it's available, rather than to wait for the whole full data set to be available before we release any information. Today's release adds around 20 variables to our QuickStats product, which is a very simple to use at a glance summary at any geography that you choose, and more than 30,000 detailed community profiles. I like this slide to just give you a sense of how much data is available. This release includes more than 80 million data points. To get to this point, more than 700 staff have worked in ABS's secure offices to scan the paper forms, code and quality check the data, and pre prepare the information for release. A number of the topics we're looking at today, such as field of study, level of educational attainment, occupation and industry, are underpinned by detailed classifications. These classifications are hierarchical and provide the means that looking at trends for broad groupings or to ensure insights at a more specific level. For example, you could look at education and training as a whole, or you could drill down to look at just the tertiary education sector if that was your area of interest. I will now hand over to Bjorn, who will share with you some of the census insights related to employment. Thanks, thanks, Bindi. 80 million data points, wow. So, uh, who am I? Um, so, I'm Bjorn Jarvis. I'm the program manager responsible for labour statistics at the ABS. Uh, and uh, I'm here today because who better to talk about employment information in the census than someone who nerds out about labour statistics every month of the year? Okay, so what are the interesting topics in the census data set when it comes to understanding employment uh, and experience of people in the labour market? So on the slide here you can see some of the key highlights, so some of the, uh, the key topics that are available from that second release of census data um, and across the products that Bindi just mentioned before. So I'm sure many people in the room and joining us online are very familiar with um, extracting that data out of the QuickStats products. So for many of you, you'll be very familiar with an, um, a range of these topics uh, from the monthly labour force survey, which is our main collection for the labour market activity of the Australian population. So just to help um, looking at labour force data and census data together, uh, we've developed a simple fact sheet to help understanding uh, when to use census data and when to use labour force data. But in a, in a simple nutshell, uh, the Labour Force Survey is specifically designed to measure employment, unemployment, um, being outside of the Labour Force with a high level of precision uh, and including precise estimates of how uh, the labour market experience of the population is changing over time on a monthly basis. Uh, the focus of that data is very much around national and state and territory data, 
while the census data provides a really rich snapshot of the population, so it provides a massive amount of data, as, as Bindi said, there's tens of millions of records of information um, about the um, employment status um, and the broader labour force status of the Australian population, and that really rich data allows you to go um, beyond what the kind of headline uh, labour information enables you uh, to go. So, for instance, to do um, regional analysis, small population analysis, or as Bindi highlighted, um, to actually drill down to very fine level occupations uh, and industries. So it gives us a very rich, very complementary set of data. Okay, so slides like this um, show some of the key kind of major value that we get from running a census uh, in comparing snapshots of the population that we have back every five years, back a very long way. So as you can see in the slide here, 1966, well and truly before my time, probably looking around the room, well and truly before a number of your times. So 2016 census data continues the narrative that we've seen over time of greater similarities between women and men in the labour market, uh, with both um, uh, women and men uh, more than 70% employed for most of those peak working years. So while the story hasn't changed that much for men over time, so the green lines drop down a bit, particularly around the peak studying years. There's been a fundamental shift, which you can see in the slide here, uh, for women, which has continued uh, with uh, the 2016 census data that we can see. So 50 years on from that 1966 line, uh, the rates of employment are more than twice what they were. So what did people tell us in the census about the 19 industries? So these are the, the top level of the industry classification. So those 19 industries that they could have been working in. So 13% of them told us that they work in healthcare and social assistance, which in 2016 uh, is our biggest employer, uh, ahead of retail, trade, education and training and construction as some of um, the next uh, biggest industries, uh, biggest employing industries in Australia. So this partly reflects the effect of the ageing population, uh, an increased focus on disability support services, uh, and also an expanding demand for childcare, which underpins that increasing employment of parents that we saw in the previous slide. So given the attention on full-time and part-time work in Australia, so that is people working above or below the 35 hour a week threshold, Census data also provides an opportunity to explore how many people are working uh, in this way uh, across the various industries. So as you can see in the slides here, uh, on the left, we've got the highest rates of full-time work, so that's the green bars. Uh, so the highest rates of full-time work were for people in, um, who are working in mining in their main jobs, so around 85%. Electricity, gas, water and waste services at around 84%, and both manufacturing and wholesale trade around 79%. So still predominantly uh, people working full-time. So on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the highest rates of the part-time work. So that's where you've got um, the larger orange bars. So accommodation and food services, 59% of people reported uh, working part-time, uh, retail trade 50%, arts and recreation uh, 47%, and healthcare and social assistance, which you remember from our previous slide, 45%, so just a little under half. So this slide shows the biggest increases and decreases in the census counts uh, for the different industries based on what people told us in the 2016 census compared to what people uh, told us in the 2011 census. So it's important when you're looking at uh, uh, slides like this and, and data more broadly to remember that the census isn't the best source when it comes to looking at movement estimates from one period to the next. So you really should go to the Labor Force survey for that. For example, there are more than a million records in both the 2011 census data set and the 2016 census data set that don't actually have a stated industry which makes measuring net changes uh, a bit difficult. For example, the manufacturing um, figure that we can see there, manufacturing certainly has continued to decline into 2016, uh, but the difference in counts suggests a bit of a higher rate of contraction than what we see in some of the other macroeconomic indicators like the Labor Force Survey. 
That said, we can still see important contrasting pictures in the data. So the industries that are expanding that we can see in the census data are the industries that we, that we see expanding across the suite of labour market and other economic information. And the same with the industries that are contracting like manufacturing. So how different are the 2011 and 2016 census pictures when we look at the states and territories? Uh, interestingly, when you're looking at a slide like this, uh, there's only four industries of the 19 um, up there. So healthcare and social assistance was the strongest growing employing industry for all the states and territories, except for New South Wales and the NT, for which it was construction. I'm sure anyone joining online from uh, either New South Wales or, or the NT will be able to look outside of your window and see um, construction uh, in full force. And, uh, and looking at the industries uh, contracting, so manufacturing was the industry that contracted the most in all of the states, and uh, public administration and safety, the greatest contracting industry in the two territories. So what's better than uh, a line graph and a dot graph? A graph that is both a dot graph and a line graph. So full-time and part-time employment varied by industries, but how have they changed at the top level? So as we can see from the dots here, uh, a greater proportion of men work full-time than women, and, and that's, that's been true um, uh, for our entire uh, history of the Australian labour market. So over the past 50 years, male full-time employment has fallen from around 97% of all employed men um, to where it is uh, now in the 2016 census data at around 78%. For women, it's dropped from around 82% to around 51%. As employment rates for women have increased dramatically, particularly as you can see, um, if you follow the dots here, so. Um, the, the straight line is giving you a bit of a trend line figure. If you're following the dots, you can see the kind of dramatic changes uh, in the female series in the 1970s and 1980s, fueled by more part-time employment opportunities. So those straight lines that show the downward trend, which may continue into the future as part-time employment continues to uh, become even more common uh, and what a number of commentators are noting as a kind of transitional pathway in and out of full-time employment, but also in and out of uh, the labour market more broadly. So having data for families and households is also incredibly important in understanding the labour market and the experience of parents, and that's where the census data also gives us a very rich snapshot. So um, while a lot of the headline uh, census information has a, a focus on people and what people are doing, because we're collecting information from households, we can also look at how the families and households um, are faring uh, as of the 2016 census compared to uh, previous censuses. So this graph shows that for parents with dependent children, there are clear differences between uh, men and women. 55% of fathers captured in the census were employed full time, compared to just over half, uh, so which, which, uh, which is more than double uh, what you can see for mothers. So we're comparing the green bars here. So for mothers, it's around 26%. So the most common combination when we're looking at paired uh, parents, so um, our mothers and fathers in the census data set, uh, is a male employed full time. So some of those 55% of, of males who are employed uh, full time uh, paired with a mother working part-time. So you can see, looking at the, the orange bar there, about 33% of mothers working part-time. So this is some of the kind of fascinating family-related stories that census data can tell you um, uh, if you slice and dice it in that particular way. Okay, so speaking of transitions and, and the stage of life, uh, this infographic is one of my favourites. So um, it's in the employment summary, and for those of you in Canberra, it's in the, the printed uh, version that you can grab a copy of on your way out. Um, I do wonder if it runs the risk of making people daydream and think of cricket. So we're, um, we're starting to get into the warmer, the warmer months of the year. So looking at this infographic, so looking at our big bash league of hours work data, the further out from the centre you get, the longer the hours worked. 
So following on from the previous graphs, we can see the effects of different rates of full-time and part-time work um, for men and women uh, really throughout the life cycle. So that green line is further out than the blue uh, throughout. So what this shows us is that uh, the average for each five-year age group, uh, which is already above 35 hours per week on average, by 25 to 29 uh, for, for men and doesn't drop below that level for men uh, until they start to transition to retirement or to retire. Whereas for women, there's an early peak around 25 to 29. It drops down slightly during the peak uh, child rearing years and then holds a reasonably consistent relationship um, to what we see with the male series uh, through the ages over time. So the great thing about how millions of records in the census data enable you to do things that you really can't do from other data is that you can do graphs uh, like this um, by single year of age, for states and territories, um, for regions, for any key subpopulation of interest. So you too can create your own cricket graph if you so desire. Okay, so who's lifting their weight in terms of unpaid work? So we've got our familiar green and blue here. This is um, another infographic that we also have in that um, employment-related summary. So this shows hours of unpaid work for those people who were also doing paid work. So this isn't um, for everyone. This is focusing on people who were also doing paid work and looking at the interplay between uh, paid work and unpaid work. So 24% of employed males are doing uh, no unpaid work, with a, 30, a further 36% doing less than five hours. So if we combine those figures together, looking at our employed males, we get a figure of around 60% in those first two categories, so either um, no unpaid work or less than five, um, compared with a corresponding figure of 36% for, for women across those first two categories. What does this tell us? Well, it provides another important snapshot on the extent to which traditional gender roles may persist, uh, including how male and female employment is also shaped by gender roles around unpaid work. So it's also possible from the census data to cross-classify the hours of unpaid work with the hours of paid work, so that you can actually see um, the extent to which there are also other differences. But that, that further comparison shows that, uh, you know, just, just how much more work in total women are doing than men uh, in Australia, even in 2016. So by now it feels like I'm doing a seminar on gender in the labour market, uh, but it's really important and, and it's one of the really interesting pictures that we get from census data every five years. It's also glaringly obvious whenever you look at, at these uh, summaries just to see those differences between the experience of men and women. So looking at occupation, we've already talked about um, how valuable uh, the census data is for being able to go to a fine level of occupation. So um, we can actually get down to the four digit and even to the six digit level of the occupation classification, which um, you could never do from a sample survey because of um, sample sizes. And it's also very difficult from administrative data, given how difficult it is to code administrative data down to that fine level of precision. But you can see that for both men and women, sale assistants are number one. Uh, though census counted twice as many um, women that were working in this as their main job compared to men. So the next, for three, uh, the next three that we've got here for men and women are quite different. So the male dominated occupation of truck drivers compared to the female uh, dominated occupation of nursing. And you can see for a lot of those um, top employing occupations for, for men and women um, that they do have a very strong gender focus. Okay, so now that we've got our heads in the occupation space, we can overlay age again. And as Chris noted before, there's a, a number of census tragics in the room. So this well and truly lives up to the uh, old census slogan of uh, everyone or, or people being broken down by age and sex. So the next three slides show how different the median age of occupations are based on who uh, was working in them. So the median, for anyone who's not familiar with what a median um, is, uh, it's a bit like an average, but it's based on if you were to line everyone up from you know, um, oldest to youngest or you know, um, highest income earner to lowest income earner, it's the person who's right in the middle of that line, so right in the middle of the distribution. So sports umpires are unsurprisingly uh, 
you know, an occupation with a median age of 17, given how young um, most umpires are. Uh, this is also the case for the other occupations here, which, which describe um, occupations with a median age that was in that, that youth range of 15 to 24, so right up to bar attendants who had a median age of 24. So this is the first of three slides. So moving on to the second slide. I can see here in Canberra a number of people anxiously looking to see if their age falls on the second slide rather than the third slide. Um, so university lecturers have a, an older median age of 29, chefs 35, GPs rounding out uh, the occupations that we've got here at 45. And then our third slide here, so occupations where we have a median age that's kind of sitting in the more experienced worker category. So truck drivers, uh, truck drivers at 48. Uh, and then you can see, uh, and this reinforces a point that, um, that Bindi mentioned earlier on, a number of the agricultural occupations. Um, and this is where census data is valuable in overlaying that detailed age with some of the fine level occupations to actually see the ageing face of Australian agricultural uh, sorry, Australian agriculture that we've seen uh, not just in the 2016 census but building through um, recent censuses and also what we've seen in uh, the agricultural census that's also run every five years. And then the last occupation that we've got here, rounding it out, looking at the crossing supervisors, unsurprisingly, a median age at 62. So speaking of older Australians, another interesting story in the 2016 uh, data, which continues a long-term narrative, is people working later in life, uh, and also more hours later in life um, than they have in previous censuses. So more than half of Australians report in the census that they were still working at 60 to 64, uh, which was still above 5% by 75 to 79. So in other words, one in 20 people aged 75 to 79 indicated uh, in their census form that they were still working with beef cattle farm at the top occupation across those age ranges. So um, look, looking at a, um, a slide like this, I always find it fascinating how the hours of work and the income pretty much level out um, around uh, those ages and, and hold constant uh, into the even older ages. Okay, and just to round that out further, this shows how that um, age distribution has changed over the past 10 years, uh, and also with a comparison looking at the past 20 years, with the age distribution of employment clearly shifting to the right. Uh, it's also possible to do this with, like I said before, any occupations to gauge how old an occupation is compared to uh, how old it was in previous censuses and to get a sense of how a particular population um, and a particular occupation who are working, um, a population working in that occupation are ageing. So this can answer some of the key questions about which occupations are struggling to either replace themselves um, or possibly some of the intergenerational dynamics where particular cohorts may struggle to hand over responsibility or to let go. So I'll close the um, employment, uh, interesting employment stories there and hand over to Phil at this point, who will talk us through some of the really interesting stories that the education data can tell. <clears throat> Thanks Bjorn, some really great uh, data stories in there and many, many more yet to be uncovered. I think I drew the short straw having to follow that presentation, but we'll see how I go. So good morning everyone, my name's Philip Wise and I'm the Director of Census Dissemination. So uh, who here uh, jumped on the ABS website yesterday to have a look at some of the data? Show of hands, nice. For those watching online, that was absolutely everybody in the room put their hand up. Um, no, very excited to talk to you about uh, education and some of the fascinating insights about the qualifications that Australians have that we uh, learned about yesterday. So what do we collect in census data about education and qualifications? The answer is a lot, as it turns out, quite a lot of information. So the census, um, as I'm sure everyone would be aware, is the best comprehensive data set that we have in Australia, uh, especially when you're looking at analysing small populations or um, you know, small geographic areas as well. We just simply don't have a more detailed data set available to us that tells us about how we live and how we work and how we study and you know, how we interact as, as family units and the houses that we live in. 
Um, in the education field, so this slide is giving you a bit of an overview about what's available uh, in census data. So some of this has been online uh, since June. So we, for example, uh, we already know that um, the proportion of 20 to 24 year old Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have completed year 12 or its equivalent has increased 15 percentage points to 47%, so really strong growth in educational attainment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. What we've got available to us now, as of yesterday, is some of the uh, post-school qualifications, so things like uh, bachelor degree attainment, uh, certificate or trade, uh, diploma, and how that's playing out um, across Australia. So. Moving on to qualifications across Australia. So 2016 census was the first time that every state and territory in Australia had more than 50% of its 15 years and over population with a qualification, which is absolutely, fant absolutely fantastic and reflecting the strong growth in educational qualification attainment that we're getting as a nation. So when I'm talking about qualifications, I'm talking about essentially everything beyond a year 10 or a year 12 schooling achievement. So as I was mentioning before, certificate trade, diploma, bachelor degree, postgrad degree, um, all of those vast and varied qualifications that we collect information about. So unsurprisingly somewhat, the ACT had the highest proportion of the population uh, with qualifications, so 65.5%. Uh, you know, we've seen that for, for many censuses in, um, in recent years, and that's unsurprising. I mean, we saw with first release that the ACT had the highest median income of all states and territories in Australia. You know, we know that, um, you know, strong public sector in the ACT and, and a lot of professionals working uh, in Canberra as well. So, the other really interesting things that we've been able to tease out with second release, so what we haven't mentioned so far in this presentation is the greater geographic level of detail available to us now, so uh, things like section of state, where we can tease out rural and urban comparisons, that's available as of yesterday. And when you have a look at that breakdown, you can see that residents of capital cities at 30% were twice as likely as regional areas to have a bachelor degree or above. And if you're looking at postgraduate attainment um, in that rural urban split, then capital cities are two and a half times as likely, um, capital city residents are two and a half times as likely to have a postgrad qualification. Uh, on the flip side, if you're looking at certificate qualifications, then people in regional areas are more likely to have a certificate qualification than in capital cities. So this slide gives you a bit of a um, longer term view of how educational qualification attainment is changing over time. So looking back over the last 40 years, what you can see here is the dark green bars, that's certificate or trade qualifications. So back in 1976, uh, before uh, the time of many of the people in the room, uh, you can see about 60% of people had a certificate or trade qualification, um, by far and away the most common qualification in Australia. Uh, but that's been decreasing quite steadily um, since then, so that you're essentially just as likely to have a bachelor degree as you are to have a certificate or trade qualification today. Um, some of the other interesting trends that you can see there, uh, the pinky purple colour uh, at the bottom there, so what that's showing is postgraduate degree attainment, and what you can see, it's growing very rapidly, especially in the last 10 years. So um, if you look from the 2011 to 2016 census, the number of um, people in Australia with a postgrad qualification has increased from 621,000 to 921,000. Uh, so essentially, you've got two Darwin's worth of people now with um, postgrad degrees. Uh, so I'm feeling like I'm getting left behind. I have a bachelor degree, but uh, thinking I might need to come back to ANU and you know get a postgrad to keep up with all this change that's going on. Um, another fascinating change in postgraduate uh, degree attainment is in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. So um, what we've seen in recent censuses is you know over the last 10 years a 210% increase in postgrad. Um, 
qualification attainment in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. And we know that that's going to continue for future censuses because we also collect the type of institution that people are attending, type of educational institution. And um, for Indigenous people, uh, that figure has increased, um, you know, it's more than doubled in the last 10 years. So strong growth that will continue for future censuses. So this is uh, one of my favourite slides. This is qualif qualifications by sex by age. So uh, without wanting to harp on about the gender wars, as Bjorn was alluding to before, um, we do get some really interesting comparisons when we break down census data by age and sex. And what you can see here, um, as soon as I saw this, I thought it was quite remarkable because, I mean, you look at our older population, so um, this is those are educational qualifications, attainment. Uh, so for people aged 75 years and over, men are twice as likely as women uh, to have a qualification. But in the younger populations, so you'll get 15 to 19 year olds and 30 to 34 year olds, women are more likely than men to have a qualification. So you know, there was a gender education gap uh, especially evident in older populations, but perhaps there's a new one the other way around with uh, men being left behind by women. Um, overall, though, I think men still have uh, higher uh, rates of educational qualification attainment than women, um, so it is narrowing. Uh, it's currently at 58% to 54%, um, but yeah, stay tuned for 2021 census results and see if uh, we have parity there. So fields of study, uh, if you think back to one of the earlier slides that Bindi was talking about, where we've been coding 10 million responses into dozens and dozens and hundreds of different uh, fields of study and um, industries of occupation and you know, all that sort of stuff, um, what came out top? So management and commerce was the top field of study. Who here in the room studied uh, management and commerce? Yeah, pretty, pretty decent scattering. I'd say probably about 22%, just like uh, census data showed. Who here studied statistics? That was me. Yeah, yeah it's not in the top five. Um, but very, very well represented in the room today. Uh, and management and commerce remained the top field of study since the last census, um, followed by engineering and related technologies. Uh, society and culture was the fastest growing field of study. So there was about 29% growth since the 2011 census in that field, and that's things like uh, politics, law, um, yeah. The health field of study, uh, number four. So thinking back to Bjorn's slides, we were talking about uh, you know, the health industry being the largest employer in Australia. Um, what, what other trends do we see? So I think you know, if, you, if you remember back to the hierarchy of um, field of study classifications, so this is just the top level. So we've got you know, only about 15 to 20 different fields of study represented in these top level um, figures here, but you can drill down much further into much more detailed data, which is the, the power of second release census data. And when you look at a finer level of detail, the growth that you can see is in accounting. So since 2006, accounting quite comfortably is the, fast, is the, the highest growing field of study in terms of number of people. So there's been an extra 138,000 people um, studying accounting over the last 10 years. We've also seen nursing with strong growth at 114,000, and then care for the ageing is in the top five at about 65,000, thinking about some of those things around ageing population and you know, increases in the, the health industry and the health sector. So this, this slide is, is great fun. So uh, this is showing in the blue text at the top, uh, this is the field of study, oh, sorry, the green text, I'm a little bit colorblind and I've got a grayscale slide on, on my printout, but uh, the green text at the top is uh, the uh, field of study where people are working in an um, occupation that's related to that field of study. So unsurprisingly, people who are working in a health-related industry that have studied medical studies as a field of study uh, are in the health industry, so that's great. Uh, if you go to hospital, you'll be treated by someone who's qualified to treat you, and that's a good news story. Um, the blue text 
at the bottom is the most common occupation in that related field of study. So 87% of people who um, have a qualification in um, medical studies work in related fields and the medical practitioners is the most common occupation within that. Uh, rounding out the top five, you've got other um, health and medical related fields of study and um, occupations, unsurprisingly. And teaching comes out very strongly as well. So uh, what we'll see in a, in a future slide is, you know, the strong, uh, you know, bachelor degree and above attainment. Uh, one of the top occupations is in um, education. So on the other end of this scale, if the slides carry forward. All right, excellent. <laughs> so, sorry. The uh, flip side of that picture I was telling you before was um, qualifications with what I call a diverse jobs outlook. So visual arts and crafts uh, was at the other end of the scale that we were looking at. So 10% um, of people who have a qualification in visual arts and crafts um, are working in a related occupation. Uh, so I think that that just goes to show um, the benefit that having a, a diverse group of people working in a particular industry can bring. Uh, I know certainly what I've been saying um, to a lot of people when we were looking at this data was that um, some of our census data experts that I've worked with actually have educational qualifications in arts or um, creative fields and that they're some of the most like technically brilliant people that I've worked with at the ABS. So um, it just kind of shows the job market in the creative arts industry is very tight. Thanks, Bill. Alrighty, so if we combine some of the uh, headline census data topics into one slide here, so on the left you've got a level of qualification, uh, you've got percent employed in the middle, and then you've got personal median weekly income on the right, and you can see here that um, as educational attainment increases, so from no non-school qualifications to certificate, advanced diploma, and then bachelor degree and above, um, you're more likely to be employed and you're also more likely to have a higher uh, median personal um, weekly income. So uh, especially when you look at the contrast between bachelor degree and above attainment with no non-school qualifications, um, essentially you're saying that we're almost 50% um, as likely to have uh, to be employed and, and have a 50% higher um, income. So this is what I was uh, foreshadowing before in terms of the top occupations by level of qualification. So on the left-hand side, if we're splitting again by bachelor degree and above to other qualifications, what you can see there is um, primary and secondary school teachers are the most common occupations where people have um, a bachelor degree or above, which is unsurprising because of the um, you know, job market for teachers as well as the need for those teachers to be qualified in that industry. Um, registered nurses were, came out top. Um, accountants features prominently in the top five as well, thinking back to the growth in people studying accounting. And in other qualifications, that's where we're getting um, some of the most common trade um, jobs. So electricians, carpenters and joiners. We're also s seeing the reflection of the uh, growth in the health services industry. So um, child carers and aged and disabled carers feature prominently in the top five as well. So th this is a good slide. Um, what should you be studying if you want to earn the big bucks? So on the top, highest earning fields of study, uh, and on the bottom, highest earning industries. So if we're looking at a field of study, uh, unsurprisingly, um, health areas feature prominently, so especially anaesthetists. So 60% of anaesthetists earn more than $3,000 a week as 
as we counted in the 2016 census. Um, I'm looking forward to the 2021 data, seeing if we see a, a spike in people um, undertaking this sort of uh, quite complex fields of study. Uh, but you're also very likely to be employed. So, I mean, you think about um, my father is retired now, but he was a um, microbiologist and um, it took him about 14 years to get his full slate of qualifications to be a medical specialist. Um, you need to be persistent and you need to love what you do, I think, to um, earn these qualifications in the particular fields of study that we're talking about here. But it does uh, come with, you know, certain responsibilities and higher um, median personal weekly incomes. So on the bottom, I think there's an interesting contrast with industry. So, you know, we have medical fields on the top, uh, fields of study, and then industry, uh, mining industries featuring quite prominently on the bottom. And um, that's, that's quite unsurprising, I think, when uh, we know about some of the wages that people are, are earning in remote WA, NT, Queensland on mine sites, um, work hard, earn lots of money, and, and come home. So this slide is, is really fascinating. This is showing the top countries of birth for qualifications. So what we've got at the top is a, a contrast between the proportion of Australian-born people uh, with a qualification and then the proportion of overseas-born people with a qualification. And obviously, um, there are a few things to bear in mind here, like, um, as I understand it, our migration policy sets minimum educational attainment standards. Um, so that does skew the overseas-born data a little bit, but it's still, nonetheless, um, quite fascinating to consider that, you know, four in five of the Indian-born population uh, in Australia have some form of um, qualification, whether that's a certificate of trade, a diploma, a postgrad degree, a bachelor degree. Uh, it's really quite remarkable and, and quite a remarkable um, snapshot of, you know, you think back to first release and uh, the strong multiculturalism that Australia has. So, you know, we talked about virtually half of the population either being born overseas or having at least one parent born overseas. And you can see now that um, those strong like diversity statistics also flow through in the educational qualifications that um, some of our migrant population are bringing into the country, which is a nice segue into the next slide, which shows the top fields of study for recent arrivals over the last 20 years. Um, what jumped out at me was accounting. Accounting features, again, 8.1% was the most common field of study for the migrant population. So just weaving together some of those strands of, you know, it was one of the fastest growing fields of study. Uh, it was one of the most common occupations for people with a bachelor degree. And now it's also one of the most common fields of study for migrants. If you're studying accounting, um, I recommend you start looking for a job as soon as possible. My apologies to those who are studying accounting. Um, that's just pure speculation. But um, some really interesting other fields of study that you can see here, like um, nursing is second. So, um, you know, we have a very strong health industry in Australia, and that's reflected with um, nursing com um, migrants coming in to, to work, and also business management, banking and finance, and hospitality. So on that, I might pass it back to Bindi to talk to us about uh, population mobility. Thanks, Phil. I hope everyone's warmed up their left-hand uh, hemispheres of their brain because some of the census data that we're going to look at now around sense of place is some of our most complex data. For those who completed the form for your household um, back in August last year, you, um, you may remember that you provided us with a number of addresses. So just to recap briefly, we asked you where you were on census night, your usual address one and five years ago, and we also asked you the address for your place of work. This data is, um, is really critical for understanding internal migration within Australia and can tell us a lot about the population dynamics. So I'm just going to give you a teaser in the next few slides of what this data can do. We all know that young people are a highly mobile group, with many transitioning from school to work or increasingly to higher education, as we heard earlier. In fact, the census 
data tells us that a staggering third of 20 and 29 year olds reported moving address in the year before the census. Similarly, 32 to 30 to 39 year olds were also highly mobile, with almost a quarter of that age group living at a different address a year ago before the census. The census data also gives us some great insights to moves across state and territory boundaries, providing some really important information when it comes to planning for infrastructure and services in, in state government budgets. This slide shows the results for Queensland, but you can do this analysis for any of the states or territories in the country. In Queensland, we saw the highest number of interstate arrivals over the past five years, with 220,000 people moving to that state. The Sunshine State was the most common destination for people leaving New South Wales and the Northern Territory. On the other hand, people leaving South Australia, WA and Tasmania were more likely to move to Victoria than they were to Queensland. And in the year leading up to the 2016 census night, New South Wales and Victoria had the highest migration from overseas, which were key factors in the population growths in those states. You can also look at this, um, this mobility data by occupational groupings. And I don't think that anyone in this room or online would be surprised that our top moving occupations are those people in the Defence Forces. However, the census data also tells us that more than two thirds of software testers, web developers and advertising specialists had moved in the past five years. And it'd be interesting to look at that by age. It's perhaps not surprisingly that most of our least likely occupations to move are farmers, and I'll still feels Phil's line that you can't take the farm with you. <laughs> the, the low rate of mobility of crossing supervisors is also not surprising given what we know from the earlier slides about the median age being 62, which is also one of our uh, most least likely to move age groups. Similarly, sports umpires at the other end of the age spectrum, medium age of 15, 17, are less likely to move from the family home and, um, and are much less likely to move. This is just one way that you can look at this mobility data. It's equally fascinating to have a look at it by socioeconomic status, family composition and housing tenure, and I saw some great media dicing this data in that way yesterday. So we've um, been focusing on a sense of place. Now we turn to a sense of workplace and how people travel to work. Method of travel to work is of significant interest and together with the destination data that we will release in the new year is a valuable resource for the analysis of and forecasting of commuting patterns and um, land use changes in, sound and, in cities and, and town planning. But to just give you the top level findings, there's a lot more that could be done with this data. As a nation, we are still a nation of car commuters, even more so than we were in 2011. 69% of the working population drove to work and an extra 5% were passengers in those cars. And that was slightly lower than in the 2011 census. Sydney had the highest proportion of people catching public transport at 21%, which was much higher than in Melbourne in second place at 13%. Canberra and Hobart were comfortably the most active commuters, with about 8% of workers walking or cycling. The 2016 census data also tells us that more than 500,000 people worked from home and that was up from 2011, which is another interesting insight into our employment in Australia. So that, that concludes our data presentation. As you can see from the presentation today, with 80 million data points, we are only able to share with you just a few of the wonderful census stories that are just waiting to be told. 
It's now over to you and others to dive in and uncover more insights about our country. With, I've just got a couple extra slides, Chris. Um, with a range of product, we have a range of products to um, support a range of uses and users. Whether you just want the headline stats for your area, all the way to those who want to create their very own detailed tables and analysis, we have a product for you. If you're interested, just go to the census webpage um, and click on which census product is best for you and find out more. So to find our census web pages, it's dead easy. Just jump onto our website and um, click the census button. Which will bring you to this page which has all the information you need, including easy access to our data products, all the detailed background you need to understand the data and its, and its use. For those of you who are interested in, um, in census data but don't necessarily want to do your own analysis, we have a range of analytical products on topics such as religion, cultural diversity, apartment living, employment and work, ageing um, and an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population and we'll be adding more of those over the, the coming months. So I will just hand now to, um, to Chris for questions. Thank you, uh, Bindi, and I'll get um, Bjorn and Phil to come up and jo well, to join us for the questions. But before they do, I think a quick round of applause. That was a very entertaining session. So with, uh, we've got some time now for questions uh, and answer. For the people in the audience here, we've got roving mics. So, um, you know, just put your hand up and when you do get the microphone, please start with your name and organisation. Um, for you, those of you online, um, please type your question via the live chat uh, function and our uh, ABS staff here will relay the question uh, via microphone. So, who'd like to start? Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name's Jeff Buchanan. I'm from ACT Council of Social Service. Um, sorry if I missed it somewhere in there. I'm just um, interested to know when the homelessness statistics will be coming out as well. I think that's in March. Is it March? Yeah. Uh, I think the publication's due to come out in um, December, from my understanding, uh, and that will contain a range of uh, data about what we collected for the homeless population. Uh, in our special strategy uh, that we conducted for the 2016 census. So keep an eye out on the website for that. Yeah. Just wave if there's an online question, but we'll take another one from the audience. Uh, thanks for that. Look, really interesting um, and great to see the data coming out. Uh, Rob Tanton from University of Canberra, uh, NatSem. Um, I had a couple of que well, I had one question, no, two questions. First question, CIFA. When are we expecting the CIFA index of 2016 to come out? In March next year. March next year, great. Yep. Um, the second question I had was um, one of Phil's, um, well, the, the, it, it was a general question. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, the area, small area statistics, but there was really no sort of data there um, in the presentation on the small area statistics, and so just you know some information on the uh, the small areas would be interesting. Um, one of the things that did come out from Phil's presentation was that the mining industries was still the top dollar, which I found interesting because my impression of the mining boom was it really sort of finished around 2011, 2012, possibly even earlier, um, and so that was something that sort of struck with me that I sort of thought, well, that's interesting. Um, and again, looking at that 
regionally would be quite interesting. You know, is it to do with increasing um, or higher salaries in the mining areas, or is it actually now higher salaries in the, the cities of people managing the um, industry or something like that? Because, as I say, um, my impression was that the mining boom really sort of, in terms of those high salaries for truck drivers, things like that, finished around 2011, 2012. Um, so that was an interesting thing that, that sort of came out. But, um, but yeah, looking forward to getting into it and doing a whole lot more analysis of that data. Thanks, Rob. Uh, if you're interested in the uh, small geographic area data, your, your best way to get into that is the quick stats. So if you're looking at If you're looking for an intro to census data, uh, just hop on to the home page that we showed you how to access before. And I think Rob's um, more a table builder man. Ro I think Rob is more a table builder man, but um, for, for everyone else, uh, quick stats, you can see the search bar on the left and then you can find you know, your local suburb, uh, anywhere up to state territory or Australia, so heaps of info in there. Um, on the mining point, so I guess what I was showing you was medians, so there might have been quite a bit of movement in, you know, the top end of that distribution, uh, or the bottom end, as you're saying. But when Table Builders released with um, the second release census data on November 10, you'll be able to have a look at, um, you know, where people are uh, working in the mining industry and and drawing those wages. So um, another way you could look at that is in our working population profile that was released yesterday. So the community profiles um, that has a lot of employment data in it, and uh, encourage you to have a look at that. Thank you. Is there a, are there any online questions yet? Not yet. That's fine. There's a couple of more in the audience here. I'm just wondering about the uh, long. Just name an organisation. Oh, sorry, please. Jeff Gilfillan from the Parliamentary Library. Um, I'm just wondering. We've heard some talk about longitudinal data. You know, uh, building up a number of censuses in the labour market area would be really interesting. Looking at how people move around. Um, you know, the part-time, full-time. Does it have casual employment as well? Can we sort of look at where people are, uh, whether they're transitioning out of states of employment into, you know, more full-time, permanent, that type of thing? That's a really great question. Our longitudinal census data set comes out in February and it is possible to do those sorts of really detailed analysis. So some of the great... Um, analysis I've seen is in areas such as Geelong and South Australia where we've seen a contraction of um, car manufacturing and you can actually look at well for those people who lost their jobs which industries have they moved into what's their circumstances and outcomes five years later so it's an amazing source of data for the sorts of analysis that you're talking about there. We're, uh, we're very happy to come out and talk to you about those things as well. Uh, I'm Andrew Fife. I'm from the Department of Employment. Um, I remember from 2006 to 2011 there were changes in the attributions of place of work, um, and this, uh, these changes were impacting rigour and methodology. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what proportion of the employed people this uh, impacted, but um, there were changes and they were quite noticeable. I'm just wondering if there's going to be any changes in methodology and rigour in terms of attributing place of work for 2011 that differ from 2011. Um, not that I'm aware of. How do you mean by attributing place well, of work? Sorry. Um, I remember when... Do you mean the, the destination zone Yeah, the, there was... Uh, um, apparently there was more rigour put into the 2011 and there was a slight change from 2006. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's any sort of... Uh, similar changes occurring for the 2016. So um, we did invest a lot of effort in improving the um, attribution, as you're saying, to, of the destination zone information. So um, that's improved quite markedly. I'm happy to talk to you about that afterwards in more detail. But um, we did make a big effort to improve our coding in that space, and, and we've seen some strong data quality improvement for that data. So. It's, uh, it's still comparable to 2011? Yeah, yeah. It's just we've done a better job of coding it to um, specific geographic areas. Just, just here, Corinne. Uh, Paul Oberhoff, retired, ex-Department of Education and Training. Um, 
I would like to uh, see a bit of an unpacking of uh, the, uh, similar to the gentleman from Parliamentary Library, unpacking of the part-time uh, data into casual and other forms, particularly in regards to the gig economy um, and also the sort of casualised forms. Um, uh, there's some interest in the union movement, for example, in uh, what they call precarious work. Um, and in that regard, uh, incomes as well, um, geographic distributions, age ranges, etc. Um, also, I have an in interest in, you know, what's happening with the um, housing situation in Australia, um, not just the homelessness, but also movement into rent rental, perhaps, um, etc. Um, I, I last worked as, as a um, geospatial analyst, so distribu uh, geographic distribution interests me as well. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that's, that's where census data gives us um, particular value in terms of you know, a really rich set of information where you can slice and dice it and look at all of the kind of spatial dynamics within the population. Uh, the fact that we collect um, industry, occupation, um, hours that people are working, income enables you to actually do a lot of that um, analysis about how the change, you know, the changing face of work, so how work is is changing over those five yearly snapshots. Uh, talking about some of the more detailed elements, like um, whether people are working on a casual basis, that's where you've got some really useful complementary stories that come out of the more kind of labour market focused statistical sources like the Labour Force Survey. So, um, you know, the power of using those two together helps to tell, um, yeah, an even greater story. Uh, I'll just make a bit of a plug. Um, the Table Builder product, which was more of a fee-for-service thing in the last census, is now freely available. Um, and that will be available, I think, with this data in November. Um, so you can actually get on and plug in the variables that you want and uh, produce it at the geographies that you want as well, free of charge. So um, have, get on and have a bit, bit of a play with it. We've got time probably for one more question. We've got an online one at the... Oh, well, we'll take two. We'll just take one in the audience and one online. Hi, um, Brian Day from Transport Canberra. Just wondering with the journey to work um, data, um, you mentioned the destination data would be available early next year. Just wondering when that might be? Uh, yeah, so I think we're looking at about February to March um, for that data, but we're planning a... Um, suite of information to be available, not just the data in Table Builder, but also uh, an analytical article exploring some of the data stories with um, Destination Zone and, and Journey to Work, and also a um, interactive map. So we're working with our geospatial colleagues uh, for, you know, for example, if you live in Belconnen but you work in the city, then this map will let you click on the Belconnen area and it will show where people are commuting to go to work and that'll be across Australia, so yeah. Trying to do some fun new things with the data. Last question online. So Mel from Education in Queensland was wondering um, if the data for families with children and no parents employed is gonna be available in 2016. Sorry, sorry, what was the question again? Um, so whether the data for families with children and no parents employed is going to be available. Yeah, so that's available now. Um, so labour force status of families is the variable that um, you're interested in, LFSF, and uh, that was part of the release yesterday. Thank you. Uh, and that draws our uh, presentation uh, to an end. Uh, for those of you uh, uh, online, please feel free to contact us um, via the email address uh, on the screen. Um, I'm not sure there is an email address on the screen. Census.data at abs.gov.au. Census abs um, we uh, have some uh, uh, coffee and uh, refreshments for those of you in the audience, and we've got a number of census experts uh, here as well. So please join us for a cup of tea after the presentation and uh, certainly engage with our census staff. They're very happy to talk about uh, the census. 
We hope you all enjoyed today's presentation, found the session useful. And again, uh, if you could join me in thanking our presenters for uh, a wonderful session. Thank you.